Welcome, dear colleagues. The present Ukrainian information service continues a series of updating you on the situation in Ukraine. Today we are talking about ensuring the stability of public and financial budgetary policy in the martial law. The Ukrainian government continues to provide the interrupted funding for medical facilities and important infrastructure facilities. All executive bodies subordinated to the Ministry of Finance, that is State Treasury, State Tax Service and State Custom Service work in close cooperation and continue to perform their functions under the martial law. It should be noted that the e Petrinka, that is electronic support, has given now to 500,000 Ukrainians the financial help in the form of 6,500 hryvnias. Today, our speaker is the Minister for Finance of Ukraine, Mr. Sergei Marchenko. Welcome, everybody. And I welcome the Ukrainians and the journalists who have joined us today. In the first place, I would like to thank you for your work so that the world knows the objective and unbiased information on the developments in Ukraine. Your contribution is difficult to overestimate. Today's briefing should concentrate on the way the functioning of the Ministry of Finance is executed. And um, today is the 30th of March, and I've been in this office for nearly two years. And I was thinking about this date in terms of communicating to you what the achievements have been over the last two years. Unfortunately, the occasion that we will celebrate this term will be uh, taken advantage of later on. But I'd rather talk uh, and dwell on what's going on in my ministry under the martial law. And I would like to highlight major points that we are facing. First of all, the priorities have changed after the war began. The key role now is to provide uninterrupted workings of the government structures. Of course, finances are a key part here. We should support our military, the Ukrainian citizenship, and literally these are the Ukrainians are the people who are between the life and death. This is to say that the priorities are well known to us. There is no discussion about the high priorities. Everybody is aware of the fact that we should provide for the uninterrupted functioning of the state meaning to provide finances to the military to the police to the citizens paying all the entitlements and salaries and of course we should introduce the changes that make sure that under the martial law we are working uninterrupted and um, pay all the payments that the government has undergone to pay Together with the Ministry of Finances, we have been able to develop the work of the tax customs treasury services and of the fiscal monitoring. We are all working under the martial law and these institutions are effective in living up to their obligations. As for the state budget, I will be brief here. Now, of course, the budget code provides for the operative and quick quick decision making. All the costs that are not of high priority are now directed towards the reserve fund according to the government decision to make sure that we are paying for the high priority goals and the Ukrainian armed forces in the first place. We have launched a couple of programs to support people who have lost their jobs, persons, and entrepreneurs. This is called the electronic support, the Iepetrinka, where we pay 6,500, and we have paid this sum to the three and a half million Ukrainians. 
and the accounts have been filled with 22 billion grievances. But all in all, we have received more than 4 million applications, and these will be met very soon. There is a special program on the displaced persons, and I will touch on that if there is need. As for the armed forces, we are executing the presidential order on uh, paying the Ukrainian military. As you will know, during the martial law period, the military personnel are paid 330,000 uh, three, grievances. And those who are in the front line receive 100,000. We have also increased in entitlements to the families that have lost their dear ones in the battle. These are major payments that we execute through the state coffer. Now that we are working under the martial law and the economy, respectively, is in the martial law status, it rubs off negatively in terms of tax payment. Some entrepreneurs pay their taxes in advance which allowed us to pay all the expenditures in a timely manner. As for the customs service, there are customs points that are not under Ukrainian control or they're in the territories that are in the area of hostilities. So we are now receiving one-fifth of uh, customs revenues as compared to the pre-war time in March we have received 6.7 billion grievances, and uh, compare that with the 32 billion before the war. But this is a an objective reality, and we should find answers to these challenges, how to cover for these losses. As for the taxes, we also have undergone a couple of steps. We paid an uh, preliminary uh, payments, and I would like to highlight here the private bank that paid billions of grievances in their commitments. That allows for paying the governmental undertakings in a timely manner. As for the tax service and the exacting of tax, of course, it also has an impact on the uh, GDP. GDP is likely to fall by 7 billion grievances. We all understand the reasons for that. Many fa facilities, industrial uh, uh, facilities, have stopped to work. And I would like to thank those entrepreneurs, those um, facilities that are continuing to pay the Texas, you are helping this country and our government in our support for the Ukrainian armed forces. I would also like to mention the development of the special program called uh, the pr presidential pr program 5.7.9. We've um, given the possibility to get the credits with the zero interest rate and to increase their income uh, and, uh, up to the uh, volume of 50 million euro. We have also provided for the development of the portfolio guarantees covered by the state. It allows us to provide the agricultural facilities with a sowing campaign. They're major recipients of this program. And Basically, we are ready to provide credits for the businesses under the given circumstances. Being aware of the necessity to finance for the taxes, the, we have launched, as you will know, the war bonds, and we've uh, held so far five auctions generating more than 30 billion grivnias coming into the state coffer. And I call on all the Ukrainians who are able to support this project. Go and buy these war bonds. They're guaranteed by the Ukrainian state. 
you can buy one bond with the face value of 1,000 hryvnia, and for businesses, they will also have some eased procedures to buy such securities under the martial law, including some of the banks and primary dealers have canceled all the premiums. And I would like to underline that this is an instrument that is 100% guaranteed by the state. It goes to support the budget, which is very important under the martial law. At the big, since the beginning of the war, we opened the accounts of the National Bank of Ukraine. We have six entries of such a nature. One that I would like to talk about is targeted towards supporting Ukrainian military, and the other one goes to the humanitarian uh, goals. And I would like to thank those Ukrainians and foreigners who have been able to, to send their monies for this special account. International front, of course, should not be forgotten. About 80% of our time is devoted to communicating with our foreign partners to ensure the uninterrupted uh, service of and service of and paying for the taxes. Our international work has brought into the Ukrainian budget about three billion dollars at the treasury. Uh, accounts. What does that mean? The International Monetary Fund has given us a prompt financial help uh, in the area of 1 million 400 million euros. From the World Bank, we have received 312 million. European Investment Bank, 340 million euros. My special thanks go to the Italian government. They provided us with 100 million euros on the 1st of March. We are working to mobilize resources from Germany, Great Britain, and other countries, including Sweden. There, is, there are a couple of other initiatives. Yesterday, we signed an agreement with the Fr French government, and we were likely to receive a 300 million credit worth on preferential basis. With Canada, we have uh, signed a bilateral agreement worth $500 million. In this context, I would like to mention the leadership of the Minister of Finance of Canada, Christia Freeland, who is an ethnic Ukrainian. She has been very helpful. And with the with help of hers, we have secured tranches from the International Monetary Fund. We have used this money to cover our state debts, and hopefully we will see developed countries that will transfer their special rights of um, loans to make sure that Ukraine lives up to its obligations. I would like to talk about the trust fund created at the in, um, International Monetary Fund that will allow all the willing countries. And Lithuania, Iceland, Great Britain have already voiced their readiness to participate. I hope that other countries will, will also join in. A few words on the following. We want to be reliable partners for our foreign creditors and we are, we are thoroughly following the procedure of covering our debts and serving our debts. Why? Because we want to be a reliant creditor, and we must be able to serve our de debts. The schedule for this year is, um, is doable, and we see all the possibilities to service our debts and pay it back. A thorough service of our debts will allow us new instruments that Ukraine will need. A special block is, has to do with the sanctions. We 
have provided a necessary communication and turned to the G7 countries, including the World Bank, to suspend the Russian participation at the International Monetary Fund and in the group of the World Bank, and to prevent Russia and Belarus to get resources from those institutions. The EPRD countries are now voting on the suspension of the services to Russia and Belarus. We've been communicating with the leadership of the bank and with the president of the EPRD, I've been in constant contact. We've been constantly cooperating with banks and investment companies and international banks, including such banks as Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, NG Group, Paribas, Barclays, and others. These institutions either suspended their activities in Russia or they are putting on hold any uh, dealings with Russia. Barclays, for example, has been actively working towards unprecedented sanctions, a comprehensive set of sanctions against Russia, and we are immensely grateful to those countries that now have come to understand that you are either on the side of the uh, good and civilization or you promote the aggressor country and you pay for the killings of the Ukrainian citizens and all the br brutality they're committi committing here in Ukraine. We are working with the tobacco companies as British American Tobacco and others, and we have called on them to suspend their activities in Russia. As of now, these companies are looking into Ukrainian proposal and hopefully very soon they will take a positive decision to exit the Russian market. These are a couple of uh, blocks that we've been working on. Other ministries are helpful. The Ministry for Digital Transformation, Ministry for Foreign Affairs are working in their uh, relative spheres and in their, in their uh, context to make sure that the sanctions are very tough on Russia, very destructive to it. This is an important step to seize the war here in Ukraine and to create conditions where any business, any transactions with Russia will be impossible through the economic pressure. We think this is a way to stop hostilities in Ukraine. To conclude, we are not doubting that Ukraine shall prevail. The whole civilized world stands shoulder to shoulder with us. There will be a lot of work to renovate country, a democratic European and free state. I have no doubt about that. There are a lot of ground to believe in such a stance, and I am standing ready to answer all your questions. You're welcome. Oksana Polishuk from Ukur Inform, if I may begin. We appreciate all the work you've been doing in such difficult times, and due to your effort, we are holding up. But let me clarify this point. As for the bonds of the domestic government loans, the last auction seems to have been less successful because you brought only 3.1 billion grievances, which is half of, uh, of what you mobilized during the first auctions. How would you explain such a decrease in um, enthusiasm? And uh, by emission, the war bonds, will you be able to, uh, to attract 400 million? Now, of course, the issue is very sensitive. The market responds to some challenges. And in order to have a constant demand for your bonds, there must be two things done, and they must be consistent. Service of your debts and continuous um, conditions for the possible investors. Our debt office and the manager of the, uh, the government commissioner for 
that service. He's working towards in, in uh, attracting a wider circle of invest uh, foreign investors. Been working with the United States, possible investors for them to provide the possibility for individuals in the United States to purchase our bonds. We, I have also communicated with the European Commissioner for Financial Markets at the European Commission, and I raised that issue to make sure that the respective regu regular regulators at the European Commission would ease the procedure to buy Ukrainian bonds for physical persons by the European Union countries. They're working for that, and we believe this will create a new demand for the Ukrainian bonds. May I ask you a question? You're welcome. Interfax Ukraine, would you tell us and explain that you that yesterday we heard from the Prime Minister special fund? Perhaps you might go into detail here. You will know something I have mentioned in my introductory notes. We've set up six accounts, and these accounts have been opened at the National Bank of Ukraine. Main accounts are to support the military and targets towards humanitarian aid. There are four additional accounts. One of them is fund to serve and uh, redeem debts. This is an account where foreigners and Ukrainians can direct their money towards covering these issues. For us, it is one of the sources. We have provided our details. That does not necessarily mean it's one of the additional sources of attracting money toward to Ukrainian budget. We have also set up businesses on renovation of Ukraine to support Ukrainian businesses. This is one of the means to attract um, charitable help. This will be a charity aid. People were not indifferent here in Ukraine and around the world and are willing to help the Ukrainian state budget. Dmitry Koshovoy, Interfax Ukraine, two questions on the legislation and the new bills. Three main laws. First is 2% uh, taxation for the private businesses, for the import of goods. And third is to uh, increase the rent payments. Do you have prognosis and forecasts for the month of April or even beyond towards May? What will be the result for this in terms of the state budget? And second question, there have been a lot of proposals regarding to the, those companies that are still working in the Russian market. Can they be taxed more if they work in Ukraine? What your proposal will be in terms of profit tax and other duties that could be exacted. What's your proposal and the attitude of the Ministry of Finance? I will begin with the latter question. Indeed, there is an initiative that we are supporting. We believe that those businesses where beneficiaries are working both in Ukraine and in the Russian Federation, and they are paying taxes there in Russia, the conditions must be created where they have to pay additional sums to, to Ukrainian budget as the contribution for the fact that they are working in the aggressor country. We are working on that with the Ministry for fi of Finance and 
we hope that there will be a political will to promote such initiative. As for the other initiatives, a lot of them are being effected. Not always the Ministry of Finance is uh, willing to support them. Many of them affect the uh, income part of the budget. And on some occasions, we have our own positions and our own vision. A couple of bills have been passed, and we will, of course, live up to this legislation, taking into account all the adjustments that have been made into the Ukrainian legislation. As for the, uh, the part of the Ukrainian budget, for example, if business doesn't want to pay the VAT, that means that they will not be able to work with the businesses that are paying their value-added tax. We don't know which share of the businesses will follow this path and whether they will be interested in such an instrument. The tax burden of 2% is very lucrative for some and not acceptable for others. We have been working on the uh, legislative framework for that, but we'll see how the business will res uh, respond. It's not a matter of your groupings of the businesses or your rangers, but I don't believe that voluntarily paying taxes does not mean avoiding places. There are territories in Ukraine, where hostilities are not taking place and businesses there are paying their taxes, restaurants and other businesses, by not paying taxes during the hostilities and creating extra incomes, this is not the task that we have been pursuing. What we want to pursue is to create new jobs and to for the money to come to the budget revenues. And those territories that are not occupied, in territories where there are no hostilities, businesses there, if they can pay even voluntarily their taxes, I call on them to do so. That means helping the Ukrainian military and Ukraine in general. The same goes for the customs. A lot of uh, easing procedures have been executed. For example, when the humanitarian come in, help comes in or goods are coming in and those businesses that are bringing in goods for commercial purposes and they are able to pay their taxes including VAT we call on them to pay their taxes it's not a matter of personal interests it's a matter of Ukrainian statehood and this is how we will provide for the budget revenues Dear colleagues, do you have more questions? You are welcome. Bogdan Slutsky from the Union. As for the bonds of the domestic government loan, when we talk into the dynamics, the volume of buying decreased since, since the first auction. It 20 billion worth was bought by the central bank. The secondary market is now raising interest rate perhaps this might explain the decrease in buying volume question do you cooperate with the national bank for them to buy these bonds of domestic government loans and was the share of the government run banks in buying these bonds thank you Indeed, under the martial law, we have a, a, a possibility for the central bank to buy our bonds at the primary market. This is an instrument that we would like to take on board in the last uh, order. It has some consequences that we would like to avoid. Our primary focus is to attract private investors including government-run banks. Even when we have an option of buying by the central bank, this is the, op the option of the last hope and last resort option. 
when it comes down to it, we will take advantage of it. This option has been agreed with our international partners and it has been greenlighted by the International Monetary Fund. If you want some more information of the participation of other banks, I will check on them and I will get such an information and will call on the uh, government-run banks to be more active. But state banks, banks are now playing another role. They, they are called to provide for the uninterrupted workings of the government. We've been, we have initiated tax credits now, so we must be very anxious about uh, in involving government-run banks, not to bring in new risks for them. Where we can attract the resources of the state banks, we do that. But the key factor is to provide for the sustainability of the banking system. This is very important. This is my thanks go to the central bank, to the banking system in general. At, since the first days of the war, you saw some run on the banks and it influenced the dynamics. The situation has been stabilized now. And even our partner countries have been, shall I call, pleasantly surprised that our banking system is trusted by the people. People trust the national currency, Grivnia, and uh, from the point of view of the banking system, we don't have any run on the banks, something that we have avoided through our high-quality decision-making process to ensure. So we must be very cautious about the number of uh, institutions attracted to the purchasing of bonds procedures. With your permission, another question from the Ukrpin Forum. More often than not, when we talk about the financial help from the international partners, the pundits put everything together, not discriminating between the loans that we will have to return and pay back and the direct microfinancial investments. So what shares are we talking about here? And what is the share of uh, international help will grow? Indeed, this is a good question and a very important issue. For us, what matters is not only to live through this complex period of martial law, but we should also foresee our ability to serve our debt, debts after the war is over. So grant aid is very important. Grant help is something that we are not bound to pay back. Those that must be paid back, of course, they are provided on the preferential uh, basis, and World Bank and IMF have uh, lended us money with the 15-year period, and this is a priority for us. Your question is very urgent. Unfortunately, the volume of the grant help in the overall structure of credits that we are working on is very low currently and uh, it uh, constitutes less than five percent around 360 million euros and we have uh, received 110 million from italy and this is very important for us to receive grant help because when we receive credits, they have to be served and paid back. There are some burdens, debt burdens, for the, for the years to come. As for the state debt, if this is not uh, secret information, 300 million provided by France to be paid back, and 110 million from Italy that is, uh, shall, should not be paid back. The difference is not that much. What must be done to motivate other countries to help Ukraine with no obligations? This is a complex 
history of politics and the con economy. Many loans that we have been receiving are a result of the agreements that we made before the war, and we are receiving them quite quickly. Many decisions have been made according to the procedures in some countries. What is the decision-making process? It's a matter of political consultations at the highest level, including presidential level, where when meeting other leaders, the president talks about the necessity of such a help. Then technically, we are able to talk to our colleagues and vis-a-vis -vis, like ministers of finance and representatives of international monetary organizations. This is a day-to-day -day work. And then we come down to format, shapes, volumes, and conditions of providing such money. In any case, this it's a matter of internal abilities of these countries. It's a matter up to every single country. Why have the country decided to provide such a help? It is explained by their budgetary possibilities. Some countries are seeing, seeing now the end of their fiscal year. Other countries are now experiencing quite complex process of providing grants. So there is a unique information in every country, and it should be taken into account, and we are adjusting towards such conditions. This is also explains the time and the condition of receiving such money. In spite of the fact that Ukraine, although it's living in such horrendous conditions, is still paying back its creditors at least until September, when we will see the peak of paying back. So there are some calls that say that cred our creditors must take into account the condition that we are living in and to restructure our debts. It is clear that Ukraine will, Ukrainian economy will have to grow faster than 3% per year. And uh, in oh, how would you weigh in on whether this is a right moment to secure restructuring conditions? Our position is very well defined. Restructuring or writing off our debts, we are not talking about that. And I will tell you why. We should be a reliant uh, partner in getting to the markets of loans and capital loans. This is a very important option for us to retain. Even if we start talking about restructuring now, this will influence the uh, debt ratings of Ukraine, the time and schedule for redeeming our debts is not that complex, as I mentioned. The peak will come in September with $900 million. Before the war, it, we would have been able to pay for that in timely manner. At this point in time, I don't see any necessity to bring up such a question of restructurization. Keeping the face even under the martial law, is something that we are different from others. This is how we are different in a positive way from others. As for other instruments that might fall under the restructuring scheme, these are only encompassing the commercial projects and the volumes there are not that fast. All other obligations, including the domestic creditors, we are able, the rollover operation, uh, but there is no necessity of that either. A clarification, the Prime Minister mentioned that they're working on the sequestering. We are all aware that under the circumstances, the Ministry for Finance, are they introducing new changes 
to the state budget? Will they come up with their initiative to the parliament? Or we can do without it? And if there are changes planned, what kind of changes are we talking about? You know that the expenditures from the budget amount to more than one and a half trillion dollars. The government has all the powers to redistribute and to sequester all the expenditures. So far, we have initiated a sequestering process in the volume of 107 billion grievances. That is, we brought down the finances of the low priority spheres. This money will go to support armed forces and other high priority needs. And we are using that money especially for that. Now we are working on the reduction of the state budget expenditures. And my colleagues and I will be discussing the issue very soon. This is something that where we can work domestically. Priorities have changed now. We have to, and we are able to finance socially important uh, expenditures and socially guaranteed payments. This is what we are working on. The Treasury is working under the martial law, as is the whole country. So we want to make sure that the country is still living. And this is what our efforts are direct towards. Dear journalists, do you have any more questions? One question, if you permit. Very soon, to the best of my knowledge, the second reading on the legislation will be passed on the fund of guaranteeing the depo individual deposits. It, since 2023, the sum of that guarantee will be different. There's one thing that under this martial law, there is one reality, but will you be guaranteeing these individual deposits 100%? Martial law will not last forever. Do you have any information on that? And what position the banks have taken if you contacted them? And in general, what's the policy here? Would you also like to comment on this draft law that talks about the writing off of a debt to the Minister of Finance that was provided by the Fund of Guaranteeing Deposits. As for the this Fund of Guaranteeing Deposits, individual ones, while working with our bands and uh, to save the banking system, we have issued some instruments. And before the war, we've been working with this government guarantees fund to painlessly restructure such commitments. This is a process that was supported by the international partners and the Minister of Finance under the given circumstances isn't losing anything. We are only providing for the uninterrupted uh, effective work of this fund. As for, for the 100% guarantees of the deposits, you know the financial system is working in the circumstances of the martial law. All the decisions passed by the National Bank have, they modify and call on the citizens for them to know that there are no instances where banks are not working or they are in the administrative regulation. This is a measure which actually is a message, a signal that the government will take care of the security of the deposits, that people should not withdraw them. More to the point, I believe this is not the best of times for such steps as withdrawal of deposits. So this is the response that I think 
I would call it, is very circumvential, but I think you get the point. But there is, is it restructuring or writing off? I think what you did in 2015 is bad thing. Government loaned itself, took some interest on that, and then wrote off the debt. You see, the issue that we faced was the capability of serving such commitments. We had negotiations for a year, and we were actively working on different options in this area. It was one of the commitments by the International Monetary Fund, one of the conditions to receive the standby credit in the previous program. During the negotiations, we reached such a result for the Ministry of Finance. Of course, we would like to get back money that was uh, put into the system, but the interests of the uninterrupted activity of, the f of this fund, fund of guaranteeing the individual deposits, I think it was a decision at the level of the statehood. We didn't proceed from the corporate logics. It was a complex issue. But here we took on board all possible risks. And if we, uh, if we had acted otherwise. Thank you. By the way, at the parliament, there is a uh, bill to the effect that the members of the supervising boards should include foreigners. Parliament seems to be against it. What is the position of the Ministry of Finance if this bill is passed into law? How will this affect the actions of the Ukrainian banks? There are some initiatives to that effect. We should be looking at every uh, step of that and its expediency or reasonable nature. Our aim is to provide for the sustainability of the banking system. And where the government of Ukraine is the owner of the bank, it is of principal matter that such banks are not negatively affected. Dear colleagues, as far as I can understand, there are no more questions. I would like to thank the minister for his meaningful answers. Colleague, thank you very much for joining in this briefing. I wish all of you victories in the information front and victory in general, and glory to Ukraine. Glories to heroes, and I thank all the colleagues I know all of you so good. For two years, we've been talking to each other on dozens of times, and I wish I could meet you personally. I hope that next briefing will be face to face and we'll be talking offline personally too with every one of you. Hold on, we shall prevail.